3,000 years ago, a nine-year-old boy was crowned king of Egypt, an empire which was one of the most powerful in the ancient world. He would become a relatively unimportant pharaoh, involved more with the passions of life than the details of state. Yet in death, Tutankhamun would play a role in history far more significant than anyone could have imagined. Few places in the world are as forsaken and unchanging as the Sahara Desert. People's lives are simple, uncomplicated by modern measures of time and mortality. The peasants mark the passing of their lifespans by the annual rotation of pasture lands and by the seasonal tilling, planting and harvesting of their meager crops. For most, the present and future exist in the shadow of the past. Symbolic of ancient Egyptian civilization are the enigmatic pyramids which dot the desert landscape. Giant monoliths, they are silent tributes to the genius of a bygone civilization. Many are now falling into ruin, but their crumbling walls reveal little of the purposes for their original existence. Most scholars are convinced that they were constructed as giant tombs for dead pharaohs. It is also documented that they became easy prey for grave robbers who either found or constructed their own passages within the mammoth walls so that they could strip the chambers of their precious artifacts. Realizing that the pyramids were being desecrated, the high Egyptian priests began diligently searching for a location where their royal tombs would go unnoticed and undisturbed. Across the Nile and 400 miles south of modern-day Cairo, the priests found what they had been looking for, a valley with imposing cliffs, an area that because it could conceal countless tombs would later become known as the Valley of the Kings. It was here that the modern quest would begin for the tomb of Tutankhamun. Just after the turn of the century, Egypt remained the keystone of the proud yet slowly diminishing British Empire. Egypt's position straddling the Suez was still all important to English military strategists. Yet for many Britons, the sprawling Sahara Desert that dominated the country represented either a warm, dry vacation spot or a land rich in archaeological treasure. The Rosetta Stone, discovered by Napoleon in 1799 and deciphered some 20 years later, finally provided the key to solving the riddle of the hieroglyphs. Written in Greek, Coptic, and in hieroglyphics, scholars were finally able to understand the tiny symbols. From pictographs and hieroglyphs unearthed during later digs in Egypt, part of the story of Tut would emerge. In search of cameras would, from these facts, recreate the days of King Tut. The boy had become crowned pharaoh in approximately 1500 BC. Information about his reign remained sketchy. All that was known was that the priestly court advisors probably extended a great deal of control over the young boy called Tutankhamun. But one significant portion of the story had not been recorded. The whereabouts of King Tut's tomb. The Valley of the Kings had already yielded the tombs of many other pharaohs. Thus, it seemed a logical place to begin the search for the final resting place of the boy monarch. In 
1921, Egyptian workers had excavated more than a dozen sites in the Valley of the Kings, vainly searching for Tut's tomb. The dream of finding gold, jewels, and other great riches in King Tutankhamun's grave seemed more and more an archaeologist's folly. Their work had been directed by a young, obsessive British civil servant named Howard Carter. His one passion in life was to find the tomb. Aiding him in his effort was Lord Carnarvon, an English nobleman who had originally sought refuge from England's damp weather in the healthful dryness of the Sahara. For five long years, Carnarvon had funded Carter's fruitless efforts to find the elusive burial plot. Despite the find of a new, more promising dig site, Carnarvon decided to return to England threatening to cut off financial support. For another year, hundreds of workers labored over the new site that Carter had found. Then, in November 1922, Carter made an extraordinary breakthrough. He wired Carnarvon, at last, made wonderful discovery in Valley. Together, Carter and Carnarvon descended the steps to the tomb. Both trembled with nervous anticipation. For each man, the passing moments meant that he was closer to fulfilling a dream. But what would they find? Would it indeed be the undisturbed sarcophagus of Tut? The royal seals had remained untouched. But did that mean that the tomb and its contents had stayed just as they were when hidden 3,000 years before? Finally, Carter felt the last bits of mortar give way. He peered inside and was stunned by the sight before him. What do you see? asked Carnarvon. There was a pause. Then Carter softly replied, wonderful things. It took the British and Egyptian governments the next 11 years to carefully remove and painstakingly catalogue all of the objects from inside the tomb. But Lord Carnarvon would not see even half of the treasure. By 1923, he would be stricken under mysterious circumstances. Prior to his return to England, Carnarvon suffered a mosquito bite. Normally, such an occurrence would not cause great alarm, but the bite became infected and he finally succumbed to its effects. Interestingly enough, legend had said that the priests had cursed the Pharaoh's tomb and that those who disturbed it would die. Newspapers around the world announced Carnarvon's death. Then, mysteriously, others began dying. Coincidentally, each person had either been associated with the tomb's opening or the examination of the objects found inside. For a while, the curse seemed very real. But the papers neglected to mention that Carter, who was the first to enter the tomb, and hundreds of others associated with Tut, remained robust and alive. Today, there seems little fear of the curse. More than seven million people in six American cities pushed their way into the Tut exhibit, eager to view the objects which had so astounded Carter and Carnarvon, and there were no reports of mysterious deaths attributed to the curse.
The nearly untouched tomb of King Tut that Carter and Carnarvon had unearthed was unmatched in history. It spoke of beauty and elegance in a vanished civilization. The romance of Tutankhamun's curse unfortunately obscured the more significant story of Tut for nearly 50 years. We are just beginning to realize that his death may have contributed to one of the most powerful religious movements in history. Many Egyptologists believe that the pyramids provided final earthly protection to royalty during their transition from the material world to that of eternal peace. Dr. James Brashler heads the Institute of Antiquities and Christianity at Claremont College. For the ancient Egyptian, death was simply a transition from one theater of existence or one arena of life to another arena which they called the West. It was the land to which one went after existence in this life came to a conclusion. Death was simply the opening up of a new kind of life that seems to have been conceived of in terms of a paradise. There was a panoply of gods to be pleased and elaborate rituals had to be performed successfully before one could enter the Egyptian Garden of Eden. The common citizen did not possess such knowledge. Only the priests could guide people to life everlasting and their special skills gave them an extraordinary hold over the lives of the Egyptians. Whether ancient Egyptians thought that they could defeat death itself through the mummification process is not known. Scientists have carefully examined the mummies of Egyptian royalty. Despite concerted efforts, researchers remain mystified by the methods utilized by the ancients to preserve the body. Three thousand year old stone reliefs depicted the immense power wielded by the priest class in ancient Egypt. It was their responsibility to begin planning for a pharaoh's death as soon as he became king. At the time of Tutankhamun's coronation, the priests remained the single most powerful body within Egyptian society. When Tutankhamun, a nine-year-old boy, came to the throne, the situation was ripe for change. Gerald LaRue is a professor of religion at the University of Southern California. Who worked with this malleable young man who helped to formulate his ideas, we don't know. Perhaps the great court advisor, I.E., was involved in this. Perhaps there were priests from Thebes who reached him. His predecessor, Akhenaten had moved away from the traditional religions of ancient Egypt. Egypt had enjoyed the freedom of worship of many gods in many different forms. But Akhenaten had made a change. He had moved from polytheism to monotheism, the emphasis on one god in one form. Following the death of Akhenaten, it is generally accepted that his belief in one God disappeared. The priests had discouraged its acceptance by the general populace because it threatened their position of power. But some scholars theorize that small groups clung to monotheism and quite possibly spread the idea across the desert. There was no way that the young child Tut could understand the religious turmoil which he had entered. The affairs of state unquestionably rested with the priests. With a child pharaoh on the throne, it would be easy for them to completely reinstate the old religion. Meanwhile, Tut wrestled with the normal problems of growing into manhood. Mm -hmm. 
Drawings made during Tutankhamun's reign often depict him with his young bride, the daughter of his predecessor Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Tut married his young bride when she was 12 and he only nine. Creation for life and his intense love for Akensen Paten would be cut short. He would not live to his 20th birthday. Scholars are not at all certain what caused the death of Tutankhamun. The mummy itself was somewhat decomposed because of the excessive use of unguents and spices that the priests carried out. And therefore, the physical evidence is ambiguous. Some who have investigated suggest then that the death of Tutankhamun probably came as a result of respiratory ailments such as tuberculosis or pneumonia. Still others believe that his death may have been hastened by poison. I, the great court priest who was present when Tut was crowned, now watched over the young pharaoh. Whether he was a member of a possible conspiracy with other court priests to terminate Tut's life is not known. Tut was now 19, an adult. It is possible that the priests feared they could no longer control him and he might return to the ways of Akhenaten. Perhaps they wished him dead, for his death, like his coronation, could serve them well. Their power over the religious direction of Egypt would continue. Following Tut's death, he was launched on a journey to afterlife. The priests left behind now made a pantheon of deities, the gods of Egypt. Bedouins still trek over the same plains where Moses fled more than 2,000 years ago to avoid persecution for his belief in one God. It is possible that Moses was influenced by those who had faithfully held to Akhenaten's belief in monotheism. Once Tut died, it can be assumed that the few believers who still remained faced the wrath of the priests. It is very likely that they became a highly committed nomadic group who tenaciously clung to their singular beliefs. Tut's death may have affected the entire sweep of Western thought and religion. Not even his priestly advisors could have envisioned such a dramatic place in history for their young king. The science of Egyptology is less than 100 years old. While the glory of the Egyptian civilization has been well documented, there remains much to be uncovered and understood about its sophisticated culture. With the unearthing of each new artifact, our knowledge grows, not only about an ancient society, but its effect upon modern man as well. Only now are we beginning to appreciate how Tut's premature death may have had a significant impact on the development of the belief in one God. A play was written many years ago in memory of a long dead Egyptian king. Two young women were chosen to play the leading roles. The play was the whim of an American writer who thought to poke fun at ancient Egyptian superstition. Legend had it 
that the priests of Egypt cursed their dead king to wander aimlessly through eternity. They did this by forbidding anyone to speak his name. We call out the name Akhenaten. That night, both women had eerie dreams about the cursed king Akhenaten. One, that she was struck across the face. In the morning, she was nearly blind. Coincidence? Or was there another force involved? A curse working its evil way after nearly 4,000 years. Egypt. It was already a great nation 3,000 years before Christ was born. Its kings built enormous monuments during their lifetimes. By the 20th century, 33 royal tombs had been excavated in the Valley of the Kings. The most exciting discovery, however, was still to come. It would be the culmination of a sequence of events that began not in Egypt, but in the green fields of England. The Berkshire Downs. High Clear Castle is the ancestral home of the Earls of Carnarvon. The Lord who presided here in the first quarter of this century would help make history. It would cost him dearly, however. The Earl did not leave the comfort of his castle and embark on the adventurer's trail by choice. A curious chain of events compelled him to go to Egypt. The present Lord Carnarvon remembers very well how it began. First of all, my father had a serious accident in Germany, a motor accident, and he was rather badly injured. He also suffered from rather weak lungs, so his doctors said to him, doesn't matter where you go, but you must go to a dry, warm climate every year from now on in the winter months. So Papa said to himself, well, that's a fine kettle of fish. He likes shooting and everything else. So he decided that he'd go off at the end of the shooting season, about the beginning of February, and he went to Egypt. The rhythm of life along the Nile was a radical change for the Earl. After he'd been there, few months, Lord Coma was sent for him and said, my dear Porchy, he said, if you're coming out here regularly, you're going to be so bored, you won't know what to do with yourself. So may I make a suggestion? Yes, indeed, I'd be honored if you'd tell me what to do. Right, he said, why don't you take up as a hobby Egyptology? He said, it's very interesting. And what's more, he said, it happens that at this moment of time, I've got the very fella who will help you best. He happens to be an awfully nice young man called Howard Carter. Howard Carter was an intense, driven man. After 15 years with the British Civil Service in Egypt, he'd been fired for refusing to apologize to a superior. Carter stayed on in Egypt because he had a dream. By the time Lord Carnarvon returned to England, he'd agreed to bankroll that dream. Fifteen years after the bargain was struck, Carter still labored in the Valley of the Kings. His dream? To find the tomb of King Tutankhamun. Professional archaeologists thought the valley had been picked clean years before. Carter disagreed. The search was exasperating. Carnarvon was threatening to cut the money off, when in November 1922, Carter unearthed a staircase. At the bottom, a door with royal seals intact. The door had been sealed more than 3,000 years before. Carter couldn't be sure he'd found Tutankhamun's tomb, but whatever lay behind the door was bound to make his years of toil worthwhile. And at that moment, he got uh, to the stage where he was able to see that there really was the jackpot, the hopes that they'd worked for all those years. They uncovered the steps, the first steps. And at that stage, he thought the only thing to do is to quickly cable to my father, tell him to come out, which he did. Carter waited patiently for Carnarvon's arrival. Together, they breached the door. Can you see anything, Carnarvon asked. Then, slowly, the answer. Yes, wonderful things.
Wonderful indeed. Carter's vision and Carnarvon's patience had paid off. Beyond treasure, there was the undisturbed body of a long dead king. The resting place of Tutankhamun, Pharaoh of Egypt. At last, Carter was face to face with his dream. Around Tutankhamun's neck, a magnificent gold collar. Carter recognized it as the vulture goddess Nekbet, a warning to intruders. There were reports of another warning on a tablet that has since vanished. Death will slay with his wings whoever disturbs the rest of the Pharaoh. There was little time to worry about curses. Ahead lay the enormous task of cataloging the treasure. Carter and Carnarvon were apparently not the first to enter the tomb after it was sealed. There was evidence that someone had rummaged around, then fled. Perhaps ancient tomb robbers frightened by the curse. Carter gathered up the great treasure thieves had abandoned, evidence that Tutankhamun reigned in the glory days of Egypt's past. He ruled from about 1334 to 1325 BC. Tutankhamun was nine when he became Pharaoh, not yet 20 when he died. In those days, Egypt exacted tribute from Asiatic princes and carried on an active trade with the Mediterranean kingdom of Manoa. Word of the discovery of Tutankhamun's treasure spread quickly. Tourists were becoming a problem. Lord Carnarvon returned to Cairo with part of the treasure. He had no way of knowing it, but he would never see England again. Fever, brought on by an infected mosquito bite, ravaged the Earl's body. When I arrived, there was my father, pulse beating in his throat. You could see he, very bloodshot eyes, obviously frightfully feverish and ill. So I say to the nurse, whatever happens, for heaven's sake, call me. The young Carnarvon went to his own room as his father fought what was to be the last battle of his life. Sure's fate, about five to two, the good lady is shaking me awake, and she said, your father's drawn his last breath. Please come quickly. Something was wrong with the lights, and young Carnarvon needed a flashlight to find his way to the Earl's bedside. Officially, the cause of Carnarvon's death would be pneumonia. The Egyptian press had another explanation. Your father disturbed the remains of King Tutankhamun. He took his revenge and he was responsible for the whole of the lights in Cairo going out at exactly the moment he died. Lord Carnarvon was only the first of many who would die shortly after visiting the tomb of Tutankhamun. The discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb was a great event, but the sudden and mysterious death of Lord Carnarvon had cast a pall on the celebration. Carnarvon's grieving son returned to England, only to find new evidence that his father might have unleashed some malevolent force, which cost him his life. 
Already, the popular press was proclaiming Lord Carnarvon's death to be the revenge of the mummy. His son took refuge behind the walls of Highclere Castle. The memory of that awful night in Cairo would not so easily be shaken. I had a little fox terrier bitch called Susie. And when I got back, very old fashion housekeeper, Mrs. McLean, said to me, I've something to tell you, my lord, a really extraordinary happening. At five minutes to four, and as you know, Cairo time is two hours, so we're two hours in front of Cairo, she said, Susie sat up on her hind legs. Her mouth was covered in foam. She let out a howl like a wolf and fell back dead. Something of a panic set in. Collectors rushed to get rid of whatever Egyptian relics they possessed. Howard Carter's assistant, Richard Bethel, died suddenly of a circulatory collapse. Bethel's father, Lord Westbury, committed suicide. The chief Egyptologist at both Paris's Louvre and New York's Metropolitan Museum died shortly after visiting the tomb. American financier Jay Gould took ill and died within days of seeing Tutankhamun's final resting place. To date, 22 deaths have been associated with the curse. Oxford University became the center for an exhaustive study of the relics removed from Tutankhamun's tomb and for an investigation of the curse many now believed was real. Oxford's Ashmolean Museum is still one of the richest repositories of Egyptian antiquities. Historian Henry Lincoln is a frequent visitor. It's very easy with our 20th century skeptical materialistic minds to dismiss the curse of the pharaohs as absolute rubbish. Well, it is just that, absolute rubbish. Death to anyone who enters this tomb is a a pretty fierce curse to somebody with a superstitious mind, but it's just a threat, and a pretty ineffectual one at that. And we all know that the curse of the pharaohs was concocted by the popular press because Lord Carnarvon had sold the rights to the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb to the Times, and the other papers wanted something sensational to write about. But the Egyptians, a curse wasn't rubbish. Tutankhamun's figured largely in the thinking about the curse. And it was Tutankhamun's father-in-law who, in fact, was cursed to wander in all eternity by the priests of Amon. The ram's head god, Amun-Ra, was dominant in Egypt before the reign of Akhenaten. Akhenaten introduced the practice of sun worship, symbolized by a new god, Aten. The priests of Amun were stripped of their power. Under this new religion, only the pharaoh could commune directly with Aten. The temples of Amun were defaced, but the priests bided their time. The old religion and the old ways went underground. Egypt's peasants apparently also maintained their loyalty to Amun. Akhenaten died in the 17th year of his reign. His tomb has never been found. Even as the young Tutankhamun was ascending the throne, the priests of Amun moved to regain their power. Akhenaten's name was eradicated from great monuments, his likenesses destroyed. There was an American artist, Joseph Lyndon Smith, working in the tombs taking copies of the wall paintings at the time that Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered. He felt it would be a good thing to intercede with the gods on behalf of Akhenaten, and to lift the curse of Amon-Ra so that the pharaoh was no longer condemned to wander forever in eternity. He was going to do this by putting on a play. A ruler is born like the atom and will endure for eternity if only we speak his name. We call out the name Akhenaten. Akhenaten, 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 
At the final dress rehearsal, something unheard of happened. At the moment when Akhenaten's own prayer was being spoken, a colossal hailstorm began. To the Egyptian helpers who were there for the play, it was as if the gods were throwing stones at them. The rehearsal had to be abandoned. The two women who were playing Akhenaten and his mother, both that night had the same dream. Each dreamt that she was standing in a temple dedicated to Amun-Ra, and the statue of the god came to life and struck them. But for each woman there was one small difference in the dream. One of the women was struck across the stomach, and the other across the face. Within 48 hours, the one who had been struck across the body was having a serious abdominal operation, and the one who had been struck across the face had the most virulent case of trachoma ever seen in a European. She almost lost her sight. Everybody associated with that little play within that period of 48 hours had been struck down by some minor illness or other. Was that the curse of the priests of Amon, still working after all those thousands of years? And if it wasn't the curse, what was it? A new chapter to the mystery of the mummy's curse opened in 1976 at the Paris airport. The occasion was an eerie state visit. The mummy of King Ramses was arriving with pomp and circumstance due a chief of state. Something terrible was happening to the mummy, and Egypt wanted France to help. The mummy was taken to the Museum of Man in Paris. In a sealed laboratory, Egyptologists gathered. The Ramesses mummy was among the most perfectly preserved of all those found in the Valley of the Kings. Now it was beginning to deteriorate rapidly. The Egyptians wanted to know if Ramesses could be saved. Tutankhamun's mummy had been ravished by the time of its discovery. Some theorized the priests of Amun deliberately thwarted the embalming procedure. There has been no public announcement to date about what the French experts found when they unwrapped the body of Ramesses. The speculation has been that a dangerous bacteria, perhaps dormant for thousands of years, is now alive and at work on the mummy. Egypt's priests knew something of biology. Perhaps they knew more than modern men imagine. In the tomb of Tutankhamun were many wonderful vessels of gold and alabaster. They were apparently designed to hold precious liquids and rare unguents. If they contained something else, something lethal, the secret died with the last priest of Amun-Ra. 1977 affords millions of Americans the opportunity to see Tutankhamun's treasures. They are on special loan from the Egyptian government and will tour museums in Washington, D.C., Chicago, New Orleans, Los Angeles, Seattle, and New York. 55 works of art from what many consider the greatest archaeological find in history. Time has eroded much of the mystery and awe which gripped discoverers Carter and Carnarvon. The curse is probably rubbish after all. Perhaps the priests of Amun-Ra tasted enough vengeance with the deaths of Lord Carnarvon and some of his close associates. After all, Howard Carter lived out a long and happy life and he was the first to break the seals on Tutankhamun's tomb. If the priests of Amun sought to obliterate the memory of Akhenaten and his heir Tutankhamun, they failed. Their names have been rediscovered and spoken again and again. To a pharaoh, that was assurance of immortality. Life, symbolized by the Ankh. Earrings, probably worn by Tutankhamun as a young boy. The wooden figures are likenesses of favorite slaves, servants for the pharaoh in the afterlife. 
Other figures guarded the young king's tomb for the 3,000 years he was forgotten. If we believe the curse, we must believe something else. We must believe that in the end, Tutankhamun triumphed over the priests of Amun. People's lives are simple, uncomplicated by modern measures of time and mortality. The peasants mark the passing of their lifespans by the annual rotation of pasture lands and by the seasonal tilling, planting and harvesting of their meager crops. For most, the present and future exist in the shadow of the past. Symbolic of ancient Egyptian civilization are the enigmatic pyramids which dot the desert landscape. Giant monoliths in Greek, Coptic, and in hieroglyphics, scholars were finally able to understand the tiny symbols. From pictographs and hieroglyphs unearthed during later digs in Egypt, part of the story of Tut would emerge. In search of cameras, would from these facts recreate the days of King Tut. The boy had become crowned pharaoh in approximately 1500 BC. Information about his reign remained sketchy. All that was known was that the priestly court advisors probably extended a great deal of control over the young boy called Tutankhamun. But one significant portion of the story had not been recorded. The whereabouts of King Tut's tomb. The Valley of the Kings had already yielded the tombs of many other pharaohs. They are silent tributes to the genius of a bygone civilization. Many are now falling into ruin but their crumbling walls reveal little of the purposes for their original existence. Most scholars are convinced that they were constructed as giant tombs for dead pharaohs. It is also documented that they became easy prey for grave robbers who either found or constructed their own passages within the mammoth walls so that they could strip the chambers of their precious artifacts. Realizing that the pyramids were being desecrated, the high Egyptian priests began diligently searching for a location where their royal tombs would go unnoticed and undisturbed. Across the Nile and 400 miles south of modern... Three thousand years ago, a nine-year-old boy was crowned king of Egypt, an empire which was one of the most powerful in the ancient world. He would become a relatively unimportant pharaoh, involved more with the passions of life than the details of state. Yet in death, Tutankhamun would play a role in history far more significant than anyone could have imagined. Few places in the world are as forsaken and unchanging as the Sahara Desert. In De Cairo, the priests found what they had been looking for, a valley with imposing cliffs. An area that, because it could conceal countless tombs, would later become known as the Valley of the Kings. It was here that the modern quest would begin for the tomb of Tutankhamun. 
just after the turn of the century, Egypt remained the keystone of the proud yet slowly diminishing British Empire. Egypt's position straddling the Suez was still all important to English military strategists. Yet for many Britons, the sprawling Sahara Desert that dominated the country represented either a warm, dry vacation spot or a land rich in archaeological treasure. The Rosetta Stone, discovered by Napoleon in 1799 and deciphered some 20 years later, finally provided the key to solving the riddle of the hieroglyphs.